<laughs> Thanks, Richard. Yeah, so uh, I'm kind of associated with this Evangelical Bible College for Western Australia, which uh, is, is a big, long, long phrase, word there, but um, it's really just a, a couple of guys who have been writing theological literature for a, about two or three decades. And uh, <clears throat> so there's no actual premises or anything. It's just a, it's just a fancy name. It's a charitable trust. So what I'm going to talk about today is really the, the sort of the problem that I'm, I've faced with uh, publishing the theology and what my ideal solution would look like. I'm going to talk about why a tank is not the solution. That will be clearer later on. Talk about proprietary format and how we can get that into restructured text. And then some domain-specific problems. Uh, and in this context, we're talking about Bible verses. And then we need to be able to get the restructured text into various different formats, the, the web, uh, PDFs for printing, and EPUBs for, for mobile. And how to automate some of these processes with Paver and Cog, and I've got a whole bunch of to-dos as well. So the problem is that we've got about 300 books that are in MS Word format. They've been written over 20 plus years, some of them a bit longer, and they cover a bunch of topics in theology. There are two primary authors, and these guys are technically challenged, uh, shall we say. Now, there's some domain-specific behavior that we need to, to uh, address as well. We've got verse references. Uh, so we've got something like John 3.16. We want to be able to click on that and go to a Bible uh, website where we can perhaps look at the context which, which that verse occurs in. <coughs> we want to be able to distribute this stuff as widely as possible. Uh, a lot of the people using this are in the third world. They don't have uh, reliable internet access, this sort of thing. Uh, so freely you've received, freely give as Jesus said. So what I really want, the, the solution that I really wanted to come up with was to have one authoritative source for the information. The last thing we want is to have uh, a source document for PDF output and a source document for HTML output and then a source document for EPUB output. <clears throat> we want one common source and be able to do all of these different sort of outputs. We want to be able to share common document fragments. Let's say we've got, um, is, it, is a fragment of a document talking about the, the sort of trials that the Apostle Paul went through. We want to, that might be in multiple different documents, and we want to be able to take that fragment and insert it into different documents and not have this, uh, not have it reproduced so that if we need to fix up a mistake or an error or add something to one, and then we have to go and find where they all are. We want we want just one source for that document fragment. We want it to be Bible version independent as well, not just all King James or, or whatever. <coughs> and this is particularly important when we come to, to translate this. Already we've had some people translate it into uh, Haitian French, uh, the sort of dialect of French that they use in Haiti, and, and some Russian. And you don't want to be converting... King James into Russian, right? You want to use the actual Bible that they use in Russia. We want our Bible references hyperlinked. When we see a, a verse reference, John 3.16, we want to be able to click on that HTML, PDF, uh, whatever. Obviously not paper. That would look funny. Doesn't work. Uh, we want to be able to build individual books, right? We, we want to be able to say, okay, I want uh, the commentary on the Gospel of John as a PDF. Or we might want the entire collection of all of the books arranged uh, in the website. So we want to be able to, be able to build that as we're, as we're uh, working with this. And we want some sort of simple method for authors to make changes as well. Uh, a simple method for technically challenged authors to make changes, which is actually quite difficult. 
as I'm finding. So first I'm going to talk about the wrong solution. That was kind of my ideal solution. <coughs> I first came up with using DITA, Darwin Information Typing Architecture, because it was, uh, I don't know if anyone's used that, it's, it's not that common, but it's, it's the enterprise way of do, dealing with large technical documents. Uh, it's XML, it's Java, it's complex, and in the end, uh, I just gave up because it's too hard. What I wanted to do was, I wanted to be able to determine dynamically where a Bible reference should point to. So we've got John 3.16, I want to say, okay, well, I'm building the document and I'm using King James, and so I want it to point to this place. And Ditter, it's, it's kind of, it's got that Java kind of static um, sort of mindset, I guess. So I realized that Ditter was basically, it was like using a tank. It's, um, it's big, it's noisy, it's uh, inefficient, it's slow, and it's just inconvenient, especially if you have to pay the lady at the toll booth. I needed something more nimble, really, and then I came up with restructured text, and I, I, I initially dismissed it as being too, too simple, not enough sort of structure uh, for what I wanted to do, but um, on my second look at it, I realized it's, it really it's pretty much exactly what I want. So it's a markup language, and we'll have a look at a, a short uh, example in a moment. It's part of the DocuTels processing system, which uh, it's, it's all written in Python. It's easy to extend in a relative way, especially compared to some of the other sort of document systems. And it allows for multiple output formats as well, and that's exactly what I'm after. And Sphinx, which uses restructured text, is used by Python itself, right, to, to do the documentation for the standard library, so it's got to be pretty good. Uh, we need hierarchical documents as well, uh, which plain restructured text doesn't give you. Sphinx uh, adds extension for that. And we've got Python and no XML. Well, not much, it's kind of hidden away. Yeah, that's a good point. Uh, hierarchical documents, what we mean is we've got a document which references other documents. Right? Plain re yeah, yeah, that sort of thing. Uh, DocuTils does uh, give a rudimentary way of doing that, but uh, particularly if you, you want to build the whole website and you've got a whole bunch of documents, you want, you want one kind of source document which says, okay, if you want to look at the commentaries, go to this place, and the commentaries, if you want to look at the commentary on whatever, you can go to that. So. So here's an example of, of restructured text. You can see the restructured text source is on the left, and the output is if perhaps uh, a PDF sort of output on the right. And uh, <coughs> what I want to point out is that, uh, in particular, is the roles up there. So emphasis, that's, a, that's what's called a role. It's inline markup. And the bit that you want to mark up is in the back text. And the, the shortcut is for just to just use stars for this particular role. And we're going to need roles for Bible verses, for Greek words, Hebrew words, and so on. You can also get uh, directives here. Uh, and that's for block level markup. And there's a, there's a default role, so... Up there, I've got emphasis is my is the is the name of that role. Here, this is just the default role, so I don't need to put the colon, whatever it is. In this case, it's title reference. And for what what I'm doing, the uh, the verse reference is the default role, so I just need to put a verse reference in back text, and then uh, Sphinx and DocuTools can do something sensible with it. So here is a how it all fits together. At, this is at, at the moment. In the top left, we've got Microsoft Word, and, uh, and, but we wanted to get it into restructured text. So this is, at the moment, it's a reasonably manual process, copy and paste, or I save it as docbook XML, which you can do from Microsoft Word, 
Uh, and then I've got a list extractor program. We'll talk about that in a moment. Once it's in restructured text, we can then add markup for verses. Okay, this is a verse reference. This is a Greek word and so on. I can add some comments. Uh, this sentence needs rewording because it doesn't make sense, something like that. We use Sphinx to, it creates a document tree internally and then from that it, it has a number of different writers for the output. Uh, and then we want, we want somehow the, order, the authors to be able to do some editing in, in this process. So uh, currently I'm uploading to Google Docs so that they can have a crack at editing on, on there. Well, it, it seems a little bit challenging for, for some. And, uh, and then I can incorporate those edits and, and round we go again. Yes? Um, when, you, when you paste out a word, I mean, I eventually visualise a document that might have footnotes, for instance. Yes. Yeah, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So restructured text has a uh, markup of doing footnotes. Right. Uh, it goes in as raw text. It goes in as raw text, yeah. Uh, it, it, well, I'll, t I'll show you in a moment. It pretty much is raw text. Yeah. Uh, so here's just a technology overview. Uh, it's on GitHub, so you can check out how far I've got up to it. I haven't got very far through the 300 documents. I've mainly worked on the on the infrastructure, using Python 3, Sphinx, Paver, um, and there's a bunch of other technologies there. I, I won this at PyCon 2010, a, a license for I, Wing IDE Professional, so I thought I'd use that, it's going all right. So here, uh, one of the problems with Microsoft Word, in particular the Microsoft Word documents that these guys have written, is that there aren't any styles. What you see is all you've got. Uh, so here, actually, we've got a list, and then there's a sublist. But what you actually, what's actually in the document, uh, this is five paragraphs, and the first one is a three, a dot, a space, and then Paul's trials. And then the next paragraph is space, 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 right parenthesis, A, close parenthesis. And so there's, they've used it as a typewriter, basically. Uh, which means you, you can't, uh, you, you've, you've got to guess, uh, do a certain amount of guessing. So my solution was I saved it as XML, .book XML, and then wrote a Python program to suck stuff out and guess the indent level. And it works most of the time, you've got to fix up a little bit. The other thing we want to do is uh, we want to recognize all of the Bible references. So we've got some text, lorem ipsum, and then we've got a, a, we've got a Bible reference in our restructured text. Uh, but we want to be able to do something sensible with that, so we need to recognize it somehow. And so we, we want to put these back ticks, right? That marks it as a, a default role in restructured text, and then we can do some processing on that. Uh, but it's not quite as simple as book, chapter, colon, verse. You've got all of these other possible... Uh, <coughs> verse reference collections. So here we've got two verse references. We've got John 3.16 and we've got John 3.20. Here we've got one verse reference, but it's, there's five verses in there. Uh, here we've got a verse reference, but it's actually a, a chapter reference. Um, and right down to you, you get something as complex as this, where you've got a whole bunch of references all strung together. And in particular, there's a few tricky things like um, John wrote the Gospel of John, but he also wrote three letters, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. And so we might not know, is this chapter 4 of the Gospel of John, verse 1, and chapter 4, verse 3, and that's the book of John, or is this, does it stop there, and this is the book of 3 John? So we've got a few interesting issues like that. But in terms of recognising it, we don't need to worry too much about any sort of ambiguities there. Uh, what we really want is regular expressions, and uh, thanks to XKCD for, um, to Randall for creating these useful things for computer science-y kind of uh, presentations. A, a regular expression, though, is nothing, nothing to be too afraid of. It's just a mini-language for specifying a set of strings, and that's pretty much all it is. But 
Along with that, it can create, you can create an efficient recognizer for that set of strings. So what we really need is a, uh, a mini language, oh, sorry, we've got a mini language, it's regular expressions. We need a regular expression to go back to recognize all of these. And I'm not going to explain or teach you regular expressions. If you don't know, that's going to be gobbledygook. Um, if you do know regular expressions, it, it'll still be mostly gobbledygook. Uh, the point here is that it's, it's nice and compact, so the, the advantage of regular expressions is that they're nice and compact, the disadvantage of regular expressions is that they're compact and uh, it's hard to know what's going on. Uh, but this is, this is our substitution. This recognises the uh, diverse reference collections and puts back ticks, and that's as easy as it as that one line function once you've got the regular expression going. Uh, <clears throat> what about Isaiah and 1 Corinthians? So, now has anybody used, uh, I know Ross, you probably have, anyone used a typewriter of that sort of error? Yep. Okay. Uh, now it hasn't got an enter key. What other keys does, does it lack? And what common keys does it lack? Control, yeah, no Windows key. <laughs> what was that? There you go, chocolate bar. <laughs> There's no one on this keyboard. There's also no zero, all right? But you didn't need those keys in the olden days because if you needed some sort of random glyph which was shaped like this, you just hit some random glyph that shaped like this, lowercase l or uppercase i or something. And so what we've got back here, this is Elzire, this is not I's, that's a, that's a lowercase l, alright, so I've come across this, this is I Corinthians, not 1 Corinthians, so th the regular expression works more or less, but the, the quality of the input's a bit sucky. Right, once we've recognised it and it's in the restructured text and we've got the back text there, now we need to be able to translate that, that verse reference, into uh, an actual reference to some website, right? So we've got two references, John 3, 16 to 18, and John 3, 20, and so we, we, we want a reference for John 3, 6, 3, 16 to 18, and a reference for John 3, 20. But the text you see for, for this one is just, is just 20. Uh, Actually, we're interested in the internal nodes, but uh, you guys are familiar with href, so it's easier to, to show it that way. So we need to tokenize our verse reference, and then we need to parse it to make sure it's legal and we can understand what all the bits mean, and then we generate the verse reference. So first step of tokenizing, well, Python's got a built-in built tokenizer, right, because it can parse itself. And so we can just use that, and it, it's close enough to what we want. Uh, so this is just the standard library called Tokenize. It's in the standard library. And you can run that, pass it to something, and it'll just spit out what the tokens are. So we can just use that. Up the top, we've got a name, which we can have a look at. OK, is in our list of books. Yep, OK, it's a book. And the other's number. We've got an operator, the colon operator. OK, it's a colon. Right, it's a chapter divider, or whatever we want to call it, sort of token. So we can use that uh, rather than having to write our own tokenizer. Not that that's terribly difficult, but you know, if it's written for you, why not? Um, now parsing, once we've got a, it split up into tokens, we want to be able to parse them. There are heaps of possible parsers available, but they're all too heavyweight. We don't, we don't need some big context-free grammar. There's no nesting of, of uh, verse references. We just want, it, it's not that difficult. Um, but we do need look ahead. So over here, uh, we don't necessarily know what's coming. We don't know if 20 is part of, uh, is a verse of chapter 3, or it's a, uh, there's another colon here. It could be chapter 20 of John, not verse 20 of chapter 3 of John. So we need to have a bit of a look ahead just to make sure that we're, we're getting right, the right um, meaning for each number. So my, the solution is to use a, a state machine. 
Uh, and the easiest, most efficient way of building a state machine is to use go-tos, uh, but Python hasn't got any go-tos, uh, which is a bit of a, a language oversight, some might say. Uh, but that's okay, because I wrote a function decorator which would add go-tos to a function. <laughs> uh, and it's there, you can download it and have a play with it if you want. Um, unfortunately, it only runs on Python 2, so uh, <coughs> no go-tos, at least I avoid getting eaten by raptors. Um, but I had to come up with some other way of, of creating my state machine to do parsing. Right. So here it is, parsing state machine, and it, it's actually pretty simple. It's, it's kind of the Pythonic way of doing things. Incidentally, there's, there's libraries available there to do uh, state machine parsing, but as a Python programmer, why use a library when I can just write, write my own one? Um, it works for, for uh, web people, so I thought I'd do that as well. Uh, at the top here, we've got parse, which, which is really the entry point into the state machine parsing. And here is the first state. It's a, it's a method, all right? And, and we, we want to swallow a book token, right? John, for example. And then we, we need to remember the text because the text is going to be the text of the link. And after a book, well, then we're expecting a chapter. So we return the next state that we want to get to. And then up here, we've just got a loop that goes through and says, OK, I'm at this state, run the state, and, and get back the next state, and then call that. And so got a nice tight little while loop. But you can see there's a function call overhead that wouldn't be there if we could use go-to's. Okay, so that's, that's uh, talking about the, the parsing, of <coughs> parsing of verse references, but now, now I'm going to talk about how to extend restructured text in Sphinx to actually do something uh, with, with these. And I'm not going to go into the details because, you know, you've probably seen enough code already um, in this conference, but roles, which are the inline markup, we, for example, we might have a, a Greek word there which we want to mark up as, this word is Greek, so when you click on it, it'll go off to explain the Greekiness of it or whatever. <coughs> and to do that, it, it's just a single, single function which will return some nodes in that internal doc tree representation. And directives as well, and that's for the block markup and restructured text, and this is pretty much the same as a role in terms of implement, implementing it, but it's a class with a run method, and that run method will return the doctrine nodes that, that make up that particular element. And these are the examples here. So Bible passage, we want to actually sort of insert a quote from the, that sort of, uh, those Bible verses. And draft comment directive, uh, this sentence doesn't make sense. Can you please reword it and that sort of stuff? Author comments. And then to tie it all together, there's, by the way, there's lots of other ways you can extend restructured text in Sphinx, but uh, that's you know, for different outputs and transforms and all that sort of carry on, but <coughs> these are the ones we're focusing on at the moment. And a domain just wraps it up all together. So I've got a Bible domain class which just says these are all the roles that I'm interested in. These are all my directives. And these are config values to tweak, tweak the knobs. Right. Uh, <coughs> now, automating the build process. The problem is I don't want to spend lots of extra effort doing manual stuff when I can just automate it. What I, what I want to do is a simple way, OK, I want to build all the documents into one big website, and I just want to be able to do that in a, in a one-liner. I want to build individual documents as well. I want to build uh, the PDF for the Gospel of John, and I want to do that as a, as a one-liner. Uh, I've got a bunch of options that I might want to specify. I, want, I might want different, a different Bible version. Uh, I might want to include draft comments or not include draft comments. There's a whole bunch of different types of options I might, I might want. Again, I want to do that all in one line and not have to start editing config files and all that sort of carry on. 
the config file for Swinx is conf.py. Python file, which actually is, makes a lot of sense for configuration files, it's great. And the solution I've come up with, or I use, is paver, which is a Python-based build slash distribution slash deployment scripting tool along the lines of make. And these are the examples of the sort of command lines I want. Now, I'm not using the Unixy kind of command line where you've got options with dashes. I thought, ah, you know, that's just, just too much work. I'll just stick all my options and stuff all in one line and Paver can figure it out. So those are the sorts of command lines that I, I came up with. Okay, this is how I'd like it to work. And then I thought, well, can I get it to work that way? Uh, and it turns, up, turns out that I can. <coughs> so. Yeah, at the top there you've got paver HTML, build everything. Uh, the, the first argument to paver is really what I want it to build and or, or what output I want it to build. And then the second one is the things that I want it to get to build and the, and the options for those things. So paver sets up the configuration by reading all of this stuff, sets it up, and, uh, and then calls Sphinx build, which actually builds, uh, does the conversion from restructured text to PDF or EPUB or whatever. So this is how I've, I've structured the whole, uh, the whole project. With restructured text, index.rst, that's your root document, right? It's like index.html in, in a web, on a website. It's, that's the one that you start off with. conf.py, that is the configuration file for this document. But I've, I'm going to have hundreds of documents, so I'm going to have hundreds of index.rsts and possibly hundreds of config, conf.py configuration files which is just a bad thing, right? Because most of them are, most of these configuration files are going to be pretty similar apart from a few, few changes. So yeah, I've come up with this way of, I, I just use one conf.py, which all the others just symlink to. So here we've got, uh, this is for the entire website. Conf.py is actually just a symbolic link to the one, to this one here. But then I've got this, this conf override.py, which is specific for uh, specific for the um, for that index to RSD. Then for each book, so I've got a group of uh, New Testament commentary or whatever book, Gospel of John, and then I've got the index for that book. Again, here it's just a symbolic link to to the common one, and then the override. This book's name is actually called whatever. So there are some configuration options which are the same, or uh, which are per book, but there are other configuration options which are more dynamic, like I want this PDF to be letter, not A4. So there are <coughs> you don't, that's not the place for those, that's, that's a command line one, but the, the ones which are book specific, like this is, output to john.tech for the tech. That's the place for those. Now, the, the good thing about the Sphinx configuration file is that it's just Python code. And you can override, you can put in whatever you want, basically, in there. Uh, and on the command line, you can override particular options. So you might say, oh, I want the Bible version to be ESV, and it will override that in the conf.py file. Actually, it doesn't override it in the file. It reads in the file and then overrides it. But you can't do complex overrides. There are some more complex st structures in this Sphinx configuration file that we can't override using the command line, and one of them is the uh, the paper size for the LaTeX output. <clears throat> you can't do that on, the, on a Unix command line, this crossed out line, because it, 
it, it doesn't work. It's, it's not reading it in as a string, which it then puts into, puts into the, um, or overrides in the config file. So what we need is that conf override, it's a static per book um, configuration file. So for example, the name is john.tech for the book of John. <coughs> and then other times we want this dynamic, okay, we want, uh, we want to be able to print out all the draft stuff and we want it in letter and so on. So the solution here I came up with is COG, which is a code generation tool. <coughs> and I'll show you what I've, what I've done with that. So Mr. Ned Batchelder is who wrote COG, and it uses Python to, that's in a file, to generate part of that file. You put, you put your COG code in a comment, right? and then when COG reads, so this is a comment inside conf.py, when you run the COG tool on this file, it finds everything between this and up there and strips the comment out and then runs that Python code and puts the resulting output at this point in the file. So what we can do is we've got an include function. I can't quite reach that. Include function, which is, which is part, of, uh, part of COG, or is it part of paver? I'm not sure. But anyway, it's there. And I use it. And so we can import that uh, conf override.py file to do our book specific configuration for the for Sphinx. And for the stuff that's on the command line, like I want this to be in letter rather than A4 format, we've got this override text which Paver will build up, uh, build up a bunch of uh, Python code in the override text uh, variable and then just cog dot out, we'll print that out. And so that will all appear in here. So then we've got <coughs> once when we are doing our, our paver command line, it can set up the conf.py exactly how we want it uh, and then we can run Sphinx and say well, where you go and it'll uh, It'll build what, exactly what we want. COG, incidentally, is actually built into Paver. I haven't shown you, talked about too much about the Paver details, uh, but it's really easy to run. You just say, OK, I want to COG this file and give it some options, and away it goes, and COG will strip out the comments, run the code, put the output in here, and Bob's your uncle. Great. Okay, one of the authors sent me an email a few weeks ago. I, came, I come from a pre-computer background, which means I can write material and send out emails, plus do some limited scanning, but nothing else. Uh, this was admittedly in res response to an enthusiastic mail I sent out saying, look, I've done all this stuff, and it, it probably overwhelmed him a bit, and he said, look, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm old, I can't do this. Uh, <coughs> but I, I really, you know, there's, there's a lot of people who, they, you know, they're really technical, they're not technical, they're really knowledgeable about their particular area, but when it comes to technical stuff, it's like, uh, you know, I don't know much about this computer stuff. So I'm trying to make it as easy as possible. I'm not sure I've really got there yet, um, but... This is my current solution. Uh, I might change it at some stage. So I published HTML using Paver. So not, not the entire website. It's just like, OK, I've got this book. I'll publish that book to HTML, to a single HTML file, and then upload it to uh, Google Docs right, or with Google Drive. Uh, actually, that turns out to be not entirely trivial because the single HTML it turns out actually references CSS in another file, and when you upload HTML to, to Google Docs, it doesn't go and reference that CSS file, obviously, because it doesn't have it. 
And so you, you get this um, really nasty looking HTML, uh, this nasty looking Google Doc. And I was like, what? what's going on? Looks right in the web browser. Um, so again, it's just another bit of Python code to scan through the uh, generated HTML. Okay, it's referencing this, re referencing this CSS, but actually that's not the one I, I want it to reference. I want the, I'm going to upload this to Google Drive CSS that I created and uh, shove that in the, in the file, in the HTML file, and gets uploaded. Then the author, I can share that you know, with, the, with Google Drive, Google Docs, also edits that and says, ah, that comment's useless, you know, the question, do, this sentence does make sense. No, the, 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 they're not like that, they're good. Um, and then I incorporate those changes into the restructured text, and let's see, I, I managed to work a go-to in, if not finish, go to step one. And that way we can just keep going with that cycle to, uh, to, to polish up uh, anything this large, you've always got polishing and improvements that you, that you need to make. Good question. That's a good. Uh, <coughs> Google Docs has got a built-in. What's changed since the last? It's a, got a built-in track changes, and uh, it's it's reasonably good, and it it just does it kind of with some sort of AI sort of thing, and so you can open a what's changed, and you can see a list of things that have changed, not a list, but you can see a list of document versions, essentially. It maintains all the document versions since you uploaded it. And, um, and there's a button down the bottom that says, because, because it, it maintains it a fairly fine granularity, and often you don't want to, okay, there's, there's one, one couple of words of change, and where, where is that could be anywhere. Um, you can reduce the granularity somewhat. There's, it's, it's a pretty rough dial, but it's either fine-grained or coarse-grained. But coarse-grained's pretty good. You can say, okay, someone made some changes over this kind of period of a, an hour or so, and then you can have a look and find out those. Yeah, absolutely. I, I mean, you need to be able to see what they've changed, right, to incorporate their changes. It's, it goes without saying. So, um, good question, though. All right, so I'm in pretty early stages of this. There's still plenty and uh, there's still heaps of work that I need to do. <coughs> Currently, I've really only converted one and a bit documents to, to this whole rest. I've been working on the overall kind of architecture to make sure that it all works. Uh, and shortly, I'll, I'll start working more on actually converting some of this stuff. I need some sort of robust versioning scheme because I've got different versions of documents, especially when translating to different languages is going to happen. I'm going to have to keep track of what changes have been made in, in translations. I haven't figured out how to do that yet. Uh, dynamic Bible version selection on the website. So one of the things that we want to be able to build is the, the website with all of the books, but I want people to say, okay, I don't really want to see this in King James because that's like 400 years old. I'm not quite that old. I want to see it in a uh, you know, different version. Um, <coughs> and at the moment, I, that's some sort of magic JavaScripty stuff, and I don't, don't know about that. Uh, so I've got to figure that out at some stage. Also, Greek, Hebrew, Aramaic. So the Bible was written in three languages originally, and Greek, Hebrew, and Aramaic. And often you'll be talking about you know, some subtle nuance between two Greek words which don't translate to English very well or something like that. It'd be, it'd be nice to say, okay, click on that Greek word, takes you off to the Greek website where you can do all your, you know, Greeky stuff that you want. It needs to actually go up on a website somewhere. Uh, there's always going to be formatting tweaks. There's a few bugs that need fixing, uh, some tests that need writing. That's pretty normal. And I could use some more GitHub features as well, like issue tracking and, and so on. <coughs> 